with my guest today is Bonnie Christian. Bonnie, welcome back to Seminary Dropout. Thank you so, so much for having me back. Um, you're well. Let's start here. Why don't you just why don't you tell everyone uh, who you are, what you do? Um, sure. So I'm a, a journalist and author. Um, for a long time, I was mainly based at The Week, um, but I, I left there earlier this summer and I'm back to, to freelance. So now you'll most often find me. Um, I have a column at Christianity Today. Um, I also am a fellow at a place called Defense Priorities, which is a foreign policy think tank. Um, and I write for uh, Reason Magazine pretty regularly. Um, and uh, uh, I recently got a, a couple pieces of the New York Times, which was very exciting. Um, and then uh, I have a book coming out this fall, which is sort of the impetus for this, um, which is called Untrustworthy, uh, The Knowledge Crisis, Breaking Our Brains, Polluting Our Politics, and Corrupting Christian Community. Um, and that is my second book. Um, and uh, I'm very excited to have it finally get out there in the world. Yeah. Well, very cool. We're really excited to have you back. So this, if anybody's watching, this is the book. Oh, I'm bad at this. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned it. Untrustworthy. The knowledge crisis breaking our brains, polluting our politics, and corrupting Christian community. Um, so I think just by that title, a lot of people will realize what's, what this is about and immediately kind of connect to it. What made you decide to write this book other than being a journalist Everything. for the last six years? <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a really yeah. sort of like obviously pressing problem. Um, and so that, that was a big part of it. And, and some of it was even just like the, the response that I got when I started delving into these sorts of um, topics in, in some of my articles. Um, like I think one of the, the pieces that I wrote that got the most feedback ever and I ended up like talking about it on CBS was about um, uh, the boomer generation especially. You know, like that when we were kids, they told us like, stay off the internet, like don't watch too much television, you're gonna like ruin your brain, you're gonna like, you know, get sucked into like crazy lies on the internet. Um, but now, you know, it's it's sort of become a, a stereotypical figure in American politics, like the boomer who sits all day watching cable news while like posting memes on Facebook. And so it's sort of a strange um, experience as an adult child um, of, of this generation to like, I know a lot of people who are my peers who are looking at their parents and like, what is going on? Like, why are you in this, like, crazy informational space after all the warnings you gave to me? Um, and so articles like, and it's not at all just the boomers, it's, it's far from it, um, but articles like that one that, that looked at different angles of sort of this knowledge crisis and the way our media environment has gotten um, so unsettling and so confusing um, got a lot of response, and so that indicated to me that there was, you know, a real appetite for, for someone to delve into this, um, and hopefully to delve into it in a way that feels um, accessible to people uh, from a lot of places in the political spectrum, and not um, sort of just like, oh, I'm going to explain, like, why the, the mainstream media is bad and hates conservatives, or, um, you know, like, the they're, they're just all corporate shills. Um, scrambling our, our progressive politics. Sorry, you cut out there at the very end. Um, uh, but I got oh. the last thing you said was <laughs> something about corporate shills. Oh, oh, just like, you know, to hopefully come to, to this discussion um, not from just like a, a, a progressive or conservative space where it's like the problem is the other side, um, but to hopefully look at it from a more... Um, balanced or, or maybe balance isn't quite the right word, but um, a, a more like politically um, omnivorous perspective to see that there are, there are problems, you know, from, from different parts of our politics and, and, you know, we're all contributing to this situation. You mentioned the, the kind of stereotype about the, the boomer. Um, mm -hmm. Is there, do we have stats on on that to show, I mean, we don't even know what metric you would use, but yeah. like that, that boomers are more vulnerable to um, believing false narratives or, um, you know, kind of being indoctrinated by that sort of thing. Yeah, the one stat that I know off the top of my head, and I believe I say this in the book, maybe not though, um, is that age 
old age is like the the demographic factor that is most correlated with sharing acts unwittingly sharing false information online so like more than when whether someone is a republican or a democrat um more than what news they consume age is or whether they're educated or not educated rich or poor age is the the single greatest factor that correlates with that um and you know there's there's also some things to do with just sort of like technological prowess um so for example there was another survey that found older users of um like facebook are more likely to think that say someone is like hand selecting what they see like they don't really understand what an algorithm is and, and how they're being fed this information um but as much as there are those trends and there, there is some age correlation like you know these levels are are a lot of young people are confused about that too so um it's by no means like if you're 25 you're you're guaranteed to to just be only reading and believing true stuff yeah so i could that's so interesting because i feel like um you know one of the things that uh that you point out in the book is that facebook and and i would assume twitter too um they they had algorithms that found out what someone what a specific user would likely find objectionable Mm -hmm. And then the first, it sounded to me like the first inclination was to just show them things that they would like, but they found out that when they did that, they actually used Facebook less. So then they switched and said, well, let's start showing them things that we know they won't like. Yeah, it was Facebook specifically, and there was a, it was a New York Times report about it. And basically, yeah, they, they found that if they stopped showing people like divisive, especially political stuff that made them angry and got them like emotional and worked up, people would log on less. And for them, apparently, like the ultimate metric is use sessions. It's not just accounts, because an account doesn't earn you any money if they're not logging in constantly. And so, um, yeah, they made a conscious choice of we're going to keep showing people stuff that gets them riled because it makes them come to our website more. So, and I think that that's what you're kind of pointing to is it's it can be difficult for people who did not grow up with this kind of technology to understand that my timeline is not just first come first serve oh, shoot, like it's not froze. just rose can you still hear me oh i can still hear you yeah i guess you can't hear me my camera and see if that makes things better okay. okay I can hear you now you can hear me now yeah it is okay. I just heard my husband come out of his office which frequently indicates something went bad with our Wi-Fi and he's going to <laughs> look okay. at it so I think that it may be a lack of bandwidth on my end okay no problem you didn't on my end you didn't freeze nothing okay. I saw you the whole time so okay. we'll just well, keep going like this cool. and we'll just edit this part out cool. um, yeah, so people who didn't grow up with this technology, I think it can be hard for them to understand that your timeline is not just first come, first serve. Like, they're not seeing everything that every one of their friends is posting that that has actually been kind of curated for them to a degree. Yeah, I mean, I would say to a, a large degree, and it's been really interesting. Um, so for a long time, sort of the, the two things keeping me active on my personal account on Facebook was a family group and a church group that I was in. Um, and the family group kind of just isn't busy anymore, and the we moved away from that church, and so I'm, I'm very, very rarely on my personal Facebook anymore. And it's been really interesting to see, since I'm not on there interacting, um, when I do log in, usually like on the way to manage my professional page, like the things it throws up in my newsfeed, because it doesn't know what I want at this point, because I haven't interacted. So it's just like throwing things at the wall, like maybe you'll like this, maybe you'll like this. And they're just like things I would never engage with because at this point it doesn't have the data to feed me precisely what would keep me there. You know, I was, so to just to be real transparent, um, I, I've been really lucky enough to have parents that didn't fall in this trap. Um, but I did have specifically a grandmother who did uh, before she passed about a year and a half ago. And 
you know, part, in our conversations, the thing that I was realizing was, it was kind of like, and I don't know if you had, I think you and I are about the same age, Bonnie, but when I was a kid, I would go to the grocery store and see magazines, like some news magazines, and then some real newspapers. And then there was also these things next to the newspapers that looked just like the newspapers, but it was like uh, President George H.W. Uh, Bush meeting with aliens, you know? Sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like, Hillary Clinton adopts that boy. Yes, yes, yeah. exactly. Um, and as a kid, that was extremely confusing and because it looked just like the real newspaper. And... Uh, you know, I would I would ask my mom like, what what's going on here? You know, and and like, how can you know, how come we, how come, Dad reads this newspaper every day, because it, there's some value there, but the one right next to it is is Clinton adopting Bat Boy. You know, yeah. Um, and I felt like a real similar thing was going on with the older generation because mm. they're like, you know. Uh, CNN is a quote unquote a news station on the internet and so is Breitbart and so yeah. is like all the and the, you know even the crazier like farther conspiratorial stuff it looks exactly the same to the older generation it's it's news online um, and so there's just a lot of a lot of confusion and there's a way it really is the like epistemological crisis because there, there's literally like the tools to discern um, what's right and wrong are not there. Yeah, I think you're right. And I, I think also, um, yeah. like, so I, my, my parents are, are not super online, um, but you know, sometimes my mom will get online. Um, and there have been times where we're sitting, like looking at the same website and I'm saying, like, this is not a high quality site. Like you should not trust this. And she's like, well, what's wrong with it? And I'm like, look at it. Like I look at it and everything about this screams, this is not trustworthy. Like you should not be reading. This is a serious thing. And she's like, I, but, but tell me what's wrong. And I'm like, it's the whole thing. If you can't see it, I can't tell you. Um, and it's just very difficult, I think, to like it's like learning another culture. And it's very, very, di like if, you, if someone from another country sat me down and was like, explain American culture to me, I would be like, I, I don't, it's, it's, it's the whole thing. Like, I, I, I don't know, I can't like just sit down and explain to you piecemeal a whole culture. Um, and the internet is very much like that. It's hard to communicate it to someone who hasn't sort of picked it up on their own, but the process of picking it up is kind of risky. Um, especially I think now with like the internet developed what it is as opposed to like the much smaller scale and often more tightly controlled um, way that we first experienced it um, and so yeah I don't I don't know how you teach that um, and I think like to what you said especially like the local news site is a very easy format to imitate and that's where a lot of these like they call themselves satire but it's like basically intended to fool you that's where the the format that a lot of these sites go for now, and so people think they're they're reading like some small town newspaper from a town they haven't heard of, and then they're never gonna see like the about page that says this is satire. They just think it's real. Yeah. Wow. And I think something similar happens with YouTube, where if a if a mm -hmm. if you can produce something that looks really high quality, which mm -hmm. the tools to do that have been made to the average person now. Mm -hmm. And, and so that can be very confusing. I mean, I think we saw that a lot during the pandemic when, you know, a, a chiropractor or whoever could make these like really high quality videos and hundreds of thousands of people are will believe their narrative because mm -hmm. it looks so legit. Yeah, yeah. Just this morning, actually, by chance, I was watching a, a video from the 2008 presidential election and back then it was like oh like this is so wild like Obama and Ron Paul supporters they're like these young kids and they're making these YouTube videos and like this is so exciting like they're doing democracy and it's all like so low tech it's like some guy with his camcorder and now like it's not cute anymore um it's not just some guy with his camcorder <coughs> doing his little like homemade rap um 
and it's just like at a whole different level that can very easily fool many many people yeah yeah it, it and you speak in the book a lot about the fallout to all of this and, and not only like national fallout where we have things like january 6th but the relational fallout where families have been divided and relatives have become like kind of people we don't even recognize anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder, did you see that um, that tweet that was going around this past week where some woman tweeted something to the effect of like, if you're not estranged from most of your family as a white person, I question your commitment to anti-racism. And it was like, I mean, <laughs> um, yeah, things are probably gonna get difficult, but like, is that is that where we're trying to end up? Like, I don't <laughs> think we right. want to land on estrangement. Um, and yeah, a, a lot of it, I mean, I think that sort of interfamilial strife is, is like really common and so much of it is, is driven by, um, you know, the, the, the different information that we're consuming. Um, I mean, and, and to some extent that's not new, like this is why there's that old norm of like, you shouldn't talk about religion and politics, um, because I think we've never been super good at handling those kinds of disagreements. Um, but it is exacerbated now by the fact that, you know, maybe 50 years ago, the the thing that's going to spark your political fight isn't two times a day, right? Like maybe the evening news and the morning paper, you've got like two times when maybe this is going to get out of hand, whereas now it's constantly on your phone. Like at literally any moment, you could just start bickering about something. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that's also so different from like you said you know our grandparents grew up and really our parents grew up with uh, i can remember this time the news was you either got the news in the newspaper or the nightly news which was mm -hmm. like an hour long mm -hmm. like the idea i mean i i think correct me if i'm wrong i think cnn was like the first cable news channel that was like 24 yeah. hour news it was the 90s and it was it was cnn and didn't it if, if i recall correctly like the two of the big um, wasn't like Kosovo and like the the Monica Lewinsky Bill Clinton scandal like those were some of the the big uh, events that they were like we got to cover this all the time. Yeah, well, and I think it used to be that the, the Desert the shows, Storm too. Yeah, Desert Storm, because um, it used to be that like sort of the like at a certain hour, you just got like the there was nothing playing like the TV would end for the night. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah right. <laughs> Right, and, the, and before you and I were born, like they yeah. would play like the Pledge of Allegiance or something. And it was like off. Um, oh. Trails. Uh, oh, the days. But you know, you can tell. One thing I notice when cable news, when I watch cable news, is that, um, boy, they are trying to fill some time. Like mm -hmm. the the minutia that they get into, and the thing mm -hmm. that they're they're trying to make a big deal out of a thing that's not really a big deal. You know. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that that's where also the kind of, the strong editorializing came into play. Because again, because you had to fill time. Mm -hmm. And so, and then now you've got to make ratings too. So mm -hmm. even the more bombastic personalities are the, the draw. Yeah. Know? Yeah, I think on cable you see that effect a lot in um, two things in particular. One is like the trend piece segments where it's like this is happening everywhere and it's like you know three kids have made a TikTok, and the other one is um like the local crime story that gets blown up to national attention that it frankly doesn't need but it you know it, it's, it's sort of like its own version of a trend piece of like this problem is coming for you and like you need to be worked up about it yeah yeah, yeah. um where did the strong uh, doubt of media, the, the, the untrusting of media, like, where did that come from? Oh, man. Um, I mean, I don't know that there's a, a single, a single thing. I think, um, on the, on the, you know, there's sort of like some standard lines of critique that you get from different parts of, like, the political spectrum, right? So on the right, it's been, like, the mainstream media doesn't include us um, for a long time now. I, I don't really remember that 
um, claim ever not being there in my lifetime. And of course, that's sort of where um, like Fox and talk radio get their success of, of saying like we're filling that gap that you're not not represented um, in the mainstream. Um, and then from the left, it, it tends to be like a lot more of, um, you know, they're just enthralled to corporate and government interests like the establishment. Um, so I think the exact nature of the distrust varies depending on your political beliefs. But um, I don't know. I, I guess there there was sort of a, a, a golden age of, of people comparatively trusting the press in, in like the, the middle of the 20th century. Um, but I, I, I think, and I think this applies to a lot of stuff, um, not just the media, but I think the middle of the 20th century was like an anomaly. It was not... A historical norm and we're not gonna get back to it and it's not something like that level of um, like a comparative lack of polarization like the major parties were were fairly similar like to the point that some commentators you can look back in those days were like do we need them to be more polarized so we can have more options on policy um, that's just not it, it wasn't like that before it hasn't been like that since um, and so when you have um, more more diversity going on in your politics, more which is a nice nicer spin than polarization. But when you have more polarization, and you have now, of course, like the fragmentation of media, so we can each get our own um, tailored to us package of information. Yes, but also we can see the contrast between what we're consuming and what other people are consuming. I think being able to see those differences by itself is a big source of of skepticism and distrust of like you know why are why are we not all receiving like the same truth um i think that it just creates unease you know i think back to um the obama administration when um you know birtherism was a big mm-hmm. thing and part of the people who were really into that um you know, one of the things that I would say was, you know, I'm not like the reason I don't believe that President Obama was not born on foreign soil is not because I love President Obama so much. Um, and it's not it's also not because um, it's not because I have a naive trust in the media it's rather that I know more how media works, which is if you're a journalist, even if you really do love President Obama, if but you're the got, person who blows that story open, you that makes your you career. You do it, yeah. You that makes your yeah. career. You are the new Bernstein, like yeah. you. You were the one, so you're gonna do that. Just you're gonna you're gonna put that under the table and bury it just because you like President Obama so much. And even if well, that and it's were not true, just one person; it's like it's a whole, hundreds. Yeah, you're not going to be the only one who's yeah. ever going to find that. Yeah, that's right. Like it's not so. It's not because I. The reason I thought that was ridiculous not because I liked Obama so much, not because I had a, a naive, you know, uh, mm-hmm. belief in the media, but because of you know the almost like uh, almost like capitalistic nature of journalism mm-hmm. is yeah. like you're going to look out for your own career and if you find the proof you're going to break that story and and even if it was again you're also probably going to be if you're that journalist you're also going to be knowledgeable enough to know that if you don't break it someone else is so you might as well be the one right yeah Yeah. and i mean this this is this is like my number one um skepticism about a lot of conspiracy theories um how many people are you alleging are keeping this quiet um, despite typically uh, very strong personal benefit, like interest in, in benefits that they could gain from not keeping it quiet. Like this is very frequently the case. Like, and it's, it's why I find a lot of them so implausible. And um, you know, even a lot of like the, the more recent conspiracy theories around like the election so implausible. Um, we're talking about thousands and thousands of people ordinary people, incompetent people, who could stand to gain so much attention, potentially money, tons of good things for them, if they, you know, revealed what happened, and no one's doing that. 
like people are just not people are not that smart people are not that self-disciplined people are not that self-sacrificing when it comes to members of the media like people just don't work that way you know so you devote um a good good section of the book talking about conspiracy theories in general Mm -hmm. and also specifically the election the 2020 election um you know i heard once that the reason that conspiracy theories get started is because there's an event that has like outsized consequences um Mm -hmm. i think i may have heard this on john oliver actually um but like for instance like 9 11 Mm -hmm. um it's like people just find it hard to believe that like you know 20 20 men Mm -hmm. fooled us all basically right like they were they were able to orchestrate this thing that was like so huge and caused wars and stuff you know Mm -hmm. um and like uh uh, uh, the kennedy assassination like Mm -hmm. really like just it all it took was one guy with a rifle Mm -hmm. and it you know changed history like there's outsized, there's small, small cause that has outsized consequence. Um, but I was wondering, like, does that hold, does that paradigm hold up for the election? Because it seems like, I guess it, I guess it would be because it would be a relatively, it would be thousands of people, but compared to the American population, I guess that's a small number of people who would have had cause consequences for the entirety of of the nation yeah um i mean i i would say that it's not necessarily just a big event but it has to be a big event perhaps where people can't understand people can't get into the mindset of the other side and so like in the in the run-up to um are you familiar with the idea of uh theory of mind uh, maybe not. I don't know. Okay, so theory of mind is something that um, humans should normally develop as they grow up. Um, basically, it's the idea of being able to understand that other people um, have their own minds and make their own decisions and reason through things, and they might have different information or values than you do, and so they might reason to a different decision than you would. And so, like little kids, very small kids, don't have this fully yet. Um, and so, which is why, like, um, you know, you, you might ask them, like, what would you do in this situation, um, if you were that person and they'll pick something that like they, that person would never pick because it makes yeah. sense to them as a three-year-old, right? But it doesn't make sense to the, the other person. They can't put themselves in another the person's position. And so I think for Americans, like, we're really struggling with like a political theory of mind where we, we cannot imagine being in the other side's position. And so, um... One thing that I found really interesting in the run-up to 2020 was, um, so in my, uh, in my, I was working at the week then, um, and in our newsroom we had a little contest of everybody made their own election map, and whoever was most accurate was going to win, um, oh man, what was it? I, I won, just so you know. Oh. Um, <laughs> it was, uh, shoot, it was like a signed photo of Rick Santorum or something, something weird like that. Um, I, now I have to remember what it was and what I've done with it. I don't know um, if I call you the winner. In that <laughs> but so everybody, we all made our maps. Um, and mine was accurate to, I think I had two states swapped, but they had almost the same uh, electoral college counts. So I won. Um, but the the people on our team who were further right were doing like Trump landslides and the people on our team who were further left were doing Biden landslides and like this was their sincere guess because they wanted to win this contest like they really thought yeah, yeah. this is what's going to happen um, and I saw that like in, in a lot of places like people were predicting landslides and the idea that it was going to be a landslide was just like th- there was never going to be a landslide like people both love and hate both of these guys um, but there was a lot of sincere belief that it could not be anything but that like their guy had to win it was so obvious everybody hates the other guy like there's no way he could win um, and I think when you go into it with that mindset and then your guy doesn't win um, well there has to be some explanation for it and they don't because the, the explanation of like he's not popular enough to win is like so repulsive and so unfathomable then there has to be some other explanation um, I, I mean, I wouldn't have been surprised if Trump won. I think he totally could have won. It was close. Um, I just don't think he did. 
Um, and because like part of the reason why it's like I don't feel the need to reach for a conspiracy theory to explain what happened is that both outcomes seemed really possible to me. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I was kind of with you too, because I, in the run up, I paid a lot of attention to the polls. Mm -hmm. Also, it, it complicates things because we have electoral college. It's not just a popular vote as well. Sure, yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I think, and, and so I think part of the, pe the why people, Trump supporters, found it so hard was because they would also, any poll leading up to the election that probably, and I think most polls were showing accurately that Biden was gonna win, not by mm -hmm. a lot, but, but by some. Um, I saw Trump supporters rejecting those too, mm -hmm. um, because, but not because, it would have been logical to say, well, the run up to the 2016 election also showed Hillary winning. Mm -hmm. So it, it, that would have been kind of a logical reason to distrust those, but mostly they were, um, I, I feel like people were distrusting them because of some sort of fraud, some sort of like shady mm -hmm. thing going on that like the liberal media is wanting to push this narrative mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. And also there was a lot of like, what, what's the word Bonnie for like the bias we have because of the people around us, like the, oh, the, yeah, yeah. the anecdotal information that we're gathering. Mm -hmm. And you know, well, if you live, in a Trump stronghold, or if you're mm -hmm. if you're attending like Trump vote parades, like it is gonna feel like everybody's voting for Trump, you know. Yeah. Uh, but there's a whole other nation out there, and we're also very we're also very segregated by you know mm -hmm. the the divide between the urban areas and the rural areas. Like that divide is huge. Um, so there's this bias of the people I know, no one who likes so-and-so, therefore mm -hmm. the whole nation must feel that way about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's been, I, I moved last summer from uh, the Twin Cities to Pennsylvania, to Pittsburgh, um, and like our, our neighborhood in the Twin Cities was like 95% Democrats and like left, like, you know, is it gonna be Liz Warren or Bernie Sanders style Democrats? Um, and then here in Pittsburgh, it's, you know, it's like quite purple. It's the people who are Democrats are still a majority, but like much more, you know, biden -y, more more moderate. Um, and it's been super interesting, like to, to uh, most places are not like this in America now. It's been very interesting to um, observe a, a more uh, mixed political environment than I had gotten used to. Um, so, how do we get, how do we get out of this, Bonnie? Um, like, how? And I both mean you know on the the macro level as a nation, but just in our individual experiences in the conversations we have with our family members. Mm -hmm. um, how do we find a way out? Well, um, I mean, I think that that maybe the the disappointing thing about my book and what I'm going to say right now um, for, for many people will be that I don't think there's any like large scale solution. Um, I think just to some degree, hopefully, and I, I don't have any sense of how long this will take, I think to some degree maybe some things will settle down in regards to how we handle the internet just as we become more used to this very, still honestly very new and very world changing and like communications technology. I mean, things got wild after the printing press came in, right? But that was like a couple hundred years, like the Reformation happened. It was several hundred years of adjustment to get used to books. Um, it, and I, so I think, you know, we're a little bit naive if we think we're gonna get used to the internet in two decades. Um, so I, I think and hope that, that sort of on the, the mass scale, some things will calm down on their own over some unknown period of time. But for now, um, unfortunately, I, I really don't think that we can like legislate or content moderate ourselves out of this. Um, there's a lot of appetite for, for that, perhaps. Um, but these, these proposals tend to be very... Uh, ill thought out um, and underdeveloped and even if we implemented them I don't think they really get at the, the core issue or could sort of like um, 
you know, stop us from just finding new places on the internet to confuse ourselves. So, uh, yeah, as, as in some ways dissatisfying as it is, I, I really think the answer is just like at an individual level and in our families and our churches and our communities, we need to be looking at um, our own habits um, and using those habits to support the development of like intellectual virtues so that we are like that I don't think our information environment is going to get better anytime soon, but we can hopefully uh, change how we are engaging it um, and how we are handling the, the information that we encounter so that we are um, not making things worse, for one thing, um, but also not making ourselves worse. Because that's, that's a really core part of it, is not just the effect that it's having on our politics and our society, but the effect that it's having on us and how it's making us, like, like impatient and twitchy and inattentive to one another, um, angry with one another, sort of like spoiling for a fight, um, eager to be estranged from our families as like proof of how good our politics are. Um, I think we, this is sort of central to it to understand that, um, intellectual virtues are, are, are virtues and what the way that we are behaving right now frequently is is unvirtuous it's it's bad it's evil it's harmful to ourselves and to the people we love well let me let me put it on me how can i be a better uh (laughs) discerner of truth and and be a part of not uh not get caught up in you know disseminating false information or playing into you know narratives that aren't helpful yeah um well, so you and I are sort of in a in an unusual position, which is that me because of my my job and you because of um, you know your 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 podcast, your writing, um, also sort of engaging in like ideas publicly. Um, we ha- are in a, an unusual position of having a little bit more of a reason to be like out there in this information, um, like reading and absorbing things. Um, but for, for the vast majority of people, and probably to a degree for us, uh, less is a, a really good place to start, like just mm. logging off. <laughs> um, I know that's, that's such like a go-to explanation, but like use of our time and attention is I think really core here. Like what are we devoting ourselves to? Um, I have a list of questions in one of the final chapters of the book, and it's things like, can you wash the dishes without listening to a podcast anymore? Can you fold laundry without watching television? Like, are you able to sit down and read a book without picking up your phone every 10 minutes or at the end of every section header? Um, like noticing is your, is your brain broken? Have your habits gotten out of hand? Like, are you going out to dinner with your spouse and reading your phone instead of talking to them? Um, noticing these these behaviors and habits in ourselves I think is a really good place to start Um, because if you know we have this idea I use an analogy in the book of um, a like a gothic cathedral we have this idea that we can like build up these virtues and then that will change our habits perhaps but it's the other way around I think you have to you have to start building good habits first and then that creates space um, like the walls of the cathedral holding up the stained glass windows that create space to for those virtues to develop. The windows can't stand up on themselves and you can't just decide to be intellectually virtuous any more than you can just, you know, decide to like something. Like you have to, you can't acquire a taste just by deciding it. You have to like keep practicing, doing, be, making a habit of trying that thing and building that taste. Um, and so I think inventorying the way that we are living um, and how how different it is from like a, a, a calmer <laughs> normal that I think we're old enough to remember. Um, I don't know, uh, are, like, do 20 year olds remember a time of not being online? I, d- I don't know that they do unless their parents were extremely restrictive. Um, but 
for most older adults, certainly, like, we can remember a time when we were not just constantly plunged into the deep end of informational chaos every day. Um, and remembering that, I think, can be helpful as a starting point to see, like, what is dysfunctional in the way that I'm living right now, and then having your addressed your that. On mine. Oh, okay. Let's get rid of the... Um, why you, don't... I, I was getting most of that, but you... Yeah, I think that might be better. Uh, yeah. I think I okay. got most of that. Tell me, tell me where it stopped, saying. and I can... Oh, uh, I'm getting a... I, I can't even remember. Probably just like the last 10 seconds of what you said. Oh, okay. If you remember what that was. I don't. <laughs> um, okay, we can just... That's okay. We can just move on. You um, can just cut it at, okay. a, at a part There's... that sounds reasonable. <laughs> okay, it'll be, it'll be fine. It'll be great. Okay. Um, so, you know, a lot of... I, I like... I don't, what are we, like, 45 minutes in here? And I've... I've not mentioned like the church or Jesus, which like <laughs> your your book is unapologetically through that lens. And I just wonder what it seems like there, sh there would be some help here <laughs> in, in scripture and in following mm -hmm. Jesus that would give us direction, that would give us some sort of a, a path through. Yeah, I, there is. And one, I, I've mentioned this, I think, in a number of venues now, but as I was researching this book, something that I came across again and again, like unprompted from pastors um, in interviews with me and in interviews with other people and posts on social media just all over, um, was an almost like eerily near verbatim quote where basically they said, like, I get an hour with people every week, but... Fox News or Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever gets them for 15, 20 hours and there's just no way that I can compete with that. Um, and that I think like struck me so much because of like how are we apportioning our time and what do we expect to happen if that's how we're, we're dividing our attention. Um, and so I think a, a big part of this is not becoming the people that our pastors can say that about. Um, like, really, you know, I, I think it's being part of a good church community is not alone enough to sort of keep your brain from being unbroken. Um, but I don't, I don't know that you're going to get there without it. I think it's, it's very fundamental that you have uh, that, that bigger rhythm um, of your life, of, of seeing people, seeing people who probably think differently than you, um, being forced to a degree to engage with them, right? And, and not forced in like a negative sense, but like sometimes if you were just friends with these folks, you know, maybe you would say like, you know what, we're too different, like it's not worth dancing around these arguments, like I just don't want to deal with this anymore, but when you go to the church together, well, if you both keep coming to church, you, you, you've got to you've got to engage with those people, and you've got to figure out a way to to do it in like an an appropriate and hopefully Christ-like way. Um, so I think the, the the use of our time and the the maintenance of those those relationships is really key, um, and and worship is key as well. I mean, so much of um, there there are a number of places where in Scripture, especially in um, John's Gospel and in um, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, where truth and love are linked. Um, like these are, are very much related concepts um, that, you know, we, we cannot, it's difficult for us to seek truth if we're not doing so in love. Um, and I think it's, it's difficult to recognize truth if we're not trying to live in love. Um, but also, you know, truth is, is understanding truth enables us to, to love right, rightly. Um, and so uh, worship is, is uh, formative for, for understanding what love and truth are um, and for being able to recognize them elsewhere. Uh, and so a lot of the, the importance of, uh, of church and of, of faith for this is about um, training us to recognize truthful things and good things and loving things, um, you know, to, to be able to know it when you see it. 
Yeah, you've got a great, a beautiful section at the end of the book about, uh, I think that this section may be titled An Epistemology of Love or something similar. And and I'll just tell people to go go get the book so that you... <laughs> but I think that I think that one of the things that was so um, dismaying during all of that and still, by that I mean the, the election and January 6th, was how quickly Christians were willing to give up a, a love, give up love, just mm. kind of cast that aside because we're, we're in the real world and, you know, all that love stuff is great for Sunday school, but we're in the real world and sometimes you got to execute people, you know? Um, and <clears throat> just, it was so, um, it was so saddening to see Christians just very quickly, very easily throw aside love for um, for political gains, for, for ends that they thought were made it justified, you know? Yeah, and I, I you know, I think that <laughs> without opening up like a whole can of worms uh, around of, yeah. um, different, different ideas of how Christians should engage in politics, um, but I think that idea of, of politics and and by extension like our our reading of and consumption of political media is a place where we can sort of set aside that church stuff oh you can't hear me wait is that now Can you, oops, can you hear me now? do this.
Can you hear me this time? Hey. Oh, hey, I'm so sorry. One second, and then you went away again. Oh, come on. You're, you're cutting out. I can just, I get like every other second of your audio. <laughs> I... Okay, it sounds like I can hear you now. Can you? Um... No, you're cutting out again. Sorry. Okay. Um, um, if we need to, I've got... Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. I've got a pretty flexible afternoon, and we've probably only got, like, five minutes left, <laughs> like, to, to, you know, kind of close it down. Yeah. Um, if you want... I mean, we could tr we can try to muscle through, or we can like try again in an hour or so, or something like that. It's up to you. Um, yeah, you're cutting out again. I think I'm guessing muscling through is probably not going to be an option. Uh, great. Okay. okay, no problem. can hear you pretty well right now. Yeah, take your time. I'm in no hurry. Don't be stressed.
Hello. Hey. Uh. I can see and hear you right now. Yeah, but it's also not using my headphones. It's using your headphones. Okay. Hold on, hold on. Okay, what about now? I think I can hear you. I can hear you great, yeah. All right. Uh, then uh, my husband's going to vacate his office for a minute and we can <laughs> finish oh, things you. up here. Yeah. Okay. Um, so where were we? I have no idea what the last thing I said was. Um, I, I think, think the, I was... Oh, the last thing you said was people were like abandoning the idea of That's right. uh, like love. Um, yeah. And I was going to say, um, yeah, so without like opening up a, a, a much bigger can of worms of like how Christians should be engaging in politics and like appropriate relations of uh, Christian and the state. Um, yeah, I, I do think that, that we have this, uh, we frequently and, and not even necessarily consciously, but by default think that when it comes to politics or by extension, like engaging in political media, talking about it with one another, um, that is, you can sort of set all that church stuff aside and like, this is a different realm. And like, um, you know, even if you personally wouldn't do, um, you know, political violence or, uh, talk about or treat people or like play hardball the way that your candidate does, like, you know, he can go out there and fight for you. And that's, that's good and fine to support him doing that. Um, and once you have sort of that subconscious assumption, um, well, all sorts of things follow from that. And, uh, you know, reading um, something that maybe isn't true, but you want it to be true, um, you know, something that, that makes your opponents out to be perhaps worse than they are and not really, you know, taking the time to, to dig into that and think, like, you know, maybe they're not actually this bad and maybe I could um, be more loving to them. You already set all that aside and so it becomes much easier to just go along um, with, with sort of everything that feeds those angry emotions and gives you um, the excitement and the thrill that you're you're looking for. Mm, that's good. Well, I am really excited about the book because I think this is one of those books that like, I think everyone should read, but it would be a really great one to give to your friends and family. Mm. Um, and and you, your tone was so... Um, needed in the book because you know it deals with facts you you're writing with your whole self which is like a journalist but also a believer and so like there's a pastoral heart there and so i think that it would help a lot of people kind of realize the kind of uh, you know the matrix we're living in um that we don't we don't have to we can choose to to break out so um go ahead Oh, no, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I, I hope so, and I'm, I'm glad that that's sort of um, the impression you've gotten as one of the first people who have read it. Um, but I would also add that I'm, I'm, you know, writing as someone who is very much, like, dealing with all of this myself. Like, this is something that I have to think about all of the time because, I mean, it, it's, it's sort of like being in, in journalism and, and writing about politics, it's a little bit like, I don't know, if you're like a... a plumber or you're working in like the sewer lines you got to think about like not not getting sick from all of the like the mm. oh, refuse yeah. that you're dealing with day in and day out and like there can be a good reason for dealing with that refuse obviously certainly we need like sewer lines um but that doesn't make it not risky to to like handle this stuff yeah yeah they're occupational hazards for sure i was yeah. just reading about how uh, someone uh, some journalist on twitter was talking about the ramifications of like watching the videos that are coming out from mm. the and mm -hmm. and is you know journalists have to do that work and that is boy like so risky to your like to your mental health you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so yeah journalists especially and we've all got to be careful about what we're taking in yeah yeah i mean i think i i'd say very early on like it's always possible that my brain is like the broken one because <laughs> you know uh, I, I chose to, to be in lots of brain-breaking situations uh, for my work all the time. Well, thanks for doing the work for us because it, it does, it matters. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 